Hey everybody, welcome to Breakfast All Day. We've survived another week. Alonzo here with Matt and Christy and our very special guest, Tim Grierson from Screen International. You may remember him from the old show. Uh, we're so excited to have him on this week. He's going to talk about news and, and reviews and all kinds of things with us, but he's also here to talk about his brand new book, This Is How You Make a Movie, which we'll be discussing later on uh, in the episode. But Tim, welcome. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. It's good to see you. Every once in a while, people say, oh, what happened to Tim Gerson? We always like when he filled in on What the Flick. So you have old school What the Flick fans out there. I have, I have said this story before, I think, but I was at Sundance a couple of years ago and I was stopped uh, in one of the venues by a random person who said, you're on What the Flick with all of them. I love you. I love that show and it's so great. And and I just love, are they here? And I said, well, I don't know if Alonzo's here, but yeah, so you guys have, have audiences uh, far and wide. So thank you guys for having me. Yeah, we are very happy to see you. We'll talk about your book in a bit. Um, there's lots of different kinds of movie news and COVID news going on. Um, the main thing is more fallout from all of this Golden Globes nonsense, this HFPA mm. nonsense. So um, earlier this week, we did a special episode talking about Oscar nominations, but now Golden Globes are back in the news. You had dozens of publicists, like more than 100 publicists, who all signed this letter and sent it to the Hollywood Foreign Press Association saying that they were going to cut off access to all their top clients unless the HFPA promised diversity and outreach Yes, Matt. It, it does seem like it was a lot of independent publicists. It didn't, it, unless I missed some, it didn't seem like it was studio and network armed of public, publicity. It seemed like it was more the personal publicists. Mm -hmm. Correct me if right, I'm wrong. But, but, you know, look, if we know anything about the HFPA, they love a selfie. So, you know, I, if, if, I understand. I understand. A, I just want to be thing. clear that, that part of why the Globes have gone on as long as they have is that the studios don't have anything invested in actually cleaning it up because they sure. can like it works they get for using the advertising right. and NBC obviously is is making money off doing the show or whatever. But yeah, I think the personal publicists are the ones who do have sway with these folks because we have come to see over the years that the famous play such a big role in why the FBA HFPA exists mm -hmm. and what True. they do. So good on them. Right. So the, so they are saying that they promise outreach. NBC, which has largely remained silent up until like the last couple of days, says that they have been working with Dick Clark Productions, which puts on the show to, you know, to they're all on the same page and wanting to diversify. It was, of course, horrifying the, the revelation that there has not been a single black member of the HFPA in like 20 years. Um, Alonzo, your publication, The Wrap, had a story just in the last day or so about how um, the HFPA rejected news conferences for several shows and movies like yes. Bridgerton, like Girls Trip, like Queen and Slim with predominantly black cast. Like they just wouldn't do these news conferences or these schmoozy events. And then Ava DuVernay retweeted that and chimed in about her own experience with When They See Us, mm. that apparently like only 20 people came to the news conference for when they see us and their questions were so inane that she actually asked out loud like have you guys even watched this show <laughs> and they were so clueless but then a bunch of them stuck around to get the selfies and a couple of them had tried to peddle their screenplays oh god <laughs> did did they nominate when they see us for anything no i think they didn't and that was one of the appalling oh, things brother. anyway um tim what do you think about all this um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of aghast, I guess, like everybody else. I'm not entirely, uh, surprised to be perfectly honest. You know, for me, it's, it's difficult. It's always been difficult to take the organization seriously. And it's hard because I know people in that group, you guys know people in that group. And I like those people very much individually, but collectively, and I think the people that I know and that you guys know actually do good work. And so I hate to see them kind of being smeared with the rest of the group. But at the same time, this is a reputation that they've had for quite some time, that they're very schmoozy, that um, they're journalists. So it's not like the National Board of Review. They actually do writing and do write about uh, film and television, but they've never been taken very seriously. And the thing that always drove me crazy- And they are that, critics also. <laughs> yeah, and so they actually do in theory know their stuff. But what always drove me crazy is that people would love watching the Golden Globes. And I never understood why people love the Golden Globes because to me, they always seemed 
like a, a cheap, lame TV show. Mm -hmm. But that was always part of the fun of it, right? Like, oh, these awards don't matter. We can just watch <laughs> celebrities get drunk. And my feeling was like, well, this whole thing as foundation is pretty corrupt and kind of terrible. So while I'm glad this news has come out, I'm glad the LA Times wrote the pieces that they did. There's a little part of me that is, I think it's kind of cute that some studios are now acting surprised and shocked. It's like- I'm Shocked, shocked, shocked. there's gambling. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like, it's okay. Like if you're uh, offended about their lack of representation and diversity, that's one thing, but this was not a surprise. No. And so it's hard for me to, I I'm glad this stuff has come to light, but at the same time, like, well, this has always been kind of the deal. Like, what did you ever expect from these guys? Yeah, yeah I, you know, I say like when the Academy a few years ago had the whole Oscar so white controversy, that was a major thing because I mean, at least for me, I take that group a little more seriously because they're the professionals who work in the film business. So if they, they are arbiters of, of whether or not movies are good. Hollywood Foreign Press, I don't hold in such high esteem. So them getting like uh, taken out to the woodshed and kind of smacked around a bit is like, it's, it's high time it's happened, but why are people actually surprised? And so watching, I'm actually very happy that as many publicity firms have come out against this. Because I think Alonzo, you're right, so that those are the types of people that will scare the hell out of the HFPA and make them want to change. I'm actually kind of curious, like, can NBC continue to have the show? I read the LA Times piece too, where they yeah. talked to, to them, to NBC, and it's like, at a certain point, it will look bad for their optics to have them air that show. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the show is the motor for everything else. So if, if, we, if we were to start at that end and then work it backwards to where like the show can remain where it is and can be an unembarrassing and non-problematic thing, then that's going to be the motor to drive everything else because that really is the whole thing. It all yeah. comes down to the show and the revenue they earn from the show, which then in turn allows them to do whatever else. And and let's be honest, there's a, there's a lot of inertia so to speak with that show being on because that show was the other big award show from back in the day you know from 20 30 years ago where there really only were a couple of big major broadcast award shows that you would get the chance to see all of these famous people in one room at the same time and the globes was where they were drinking on camera as opposed to the oscars <laughs> where they're sitting in a theater drinking and they have to the out. <laughs> right um and there was kind of that anything goes attitude towards the Globes, and it felt a little bit more intimate than, say, the Oscars. And I think that they've coasted on that for a while. And I think that's allowed them, you know, being the other big show on NBC, like all these other shows like SAG and everybody else are like the Johnny Come Latelys. And, and I think the Globes gotten away with what they, you know, the HFPA's gotten away with things for a while. And I think, yeah, that it's, it's finally you know, coming back on him, I will see what happens. I mean, I'm still, like I've been saying for a couple of weeks, I'm still of a mind that like both that and the Oscars need to publish their full list of voting members. Like make I it just, real obvious. I just wonder, does it matter? Like let's say the HFPA diversifies in ways it never has before and they're all on the up and up all of a sudden, like will they immediately be taken seriously? I don't know. Does that come in time when they I start choosing that depends good on, things? Depends on the membership, right? Do they care? I mean, I, I don't know. That, too. I, don't, I don't know that they care about <laughs> being taken seriously. I think they just yeah. want to be taken seriously by the studios who want an award from them mm -hmm. and reap whatever benefits they get from that. If the if if cineasts or audiences or whatever, I mean, like, do do people ever talk about? I mean, unless you're one of those people who does nothing all year but write about awards and handicap awards for for websites, like who remembers who won a Golden Globe two years ago? You know. Yeah, I think it's shape, kind of, shape like, of water, shape of water, right? <laughs> I mean, if you were the winner, you did. the Martian. I know we remember that one because yeah. one was a comedy. Well, I, I, I feel like with like it's the same thing as with any critics organization. You look at their nominations and you look at who they who they pick as winners, and mm -hmm. that's kind of how you determine if a group is worth taking seriously or not. Mm -hmm. um, if they have good nominations and they have good winners over the next couple of years, then yeah, then you say, yeah, they've turned the corner, they've gotten their stuff together. If they continue to decide, oh, you know, The Martian can be a comedy. We have no problem with that. Um, if they send if us that, to Venice, let's nominate the tourist. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, if, if, if Emily in Paris gets lots of nominations, then probably they well, haven't cleaned up their act. But it didn't. Didn't it? 
Emily in Paris did not get the nominations despite sending all these assholes out to France for a junket. But I mean, they, let's let's not forget. Like there was a time in the '80s when the Golden Globes got taken off of television because of the whole Pia Zadora scandal, <laughs> and they had to sort of work their way back after that. And so, like, this is version 2.0 of this yeah. group that has always been like, "Who are y'all, and what are you doing?" You know. So Pia 2.0. Uh, I like yeah. Evolution would be nice, but I think it's still at the end of the day going to be the same old, you know, like ridiculous awards, but an award show that people enjoy watching, even though it means nothing. In other awards news, uh, China is going to censor parts of the Oscar broadcast over the nomination of a documentary short called Do Not Split, which is about the Hong Kong protests. So China going to China. Yeah, there, there is that. Um, other sort of inside baseball industry news, and then we'll move on. Um, everyone's favorite awards pundit, film pundit, Jeff Wells, has been kicked out of the Critics' Choice Association. This is sort of inside baseball, but if you follow film and film writing and film punditry, this is a, a human being who writes all kinds Use of that term, gross... human being loosely. Human being, quote unquote. He writes all kinds of like gross, incendiary, controversial nonsense just to be a shit stirrer. Um, and he wrote some kind of disgusting stuff on his blog after the shootings in Atlanta that left eight people dead, including six Asian women, and um, just part of the you know the awful, awful string of examples of Asian violence um, over the last year or so. And he posted some awful transcript of a conversation he had with a couple of other friends who all are saying, oh, Nomadland's totally going to win Best Picture now. If not that, then Minari. And like, it just, it was really crass. And so um, then he deleted it, but it was too late. And so his critic group has booted him. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, Wells has a record of saying horrible stuff. You know, he talks about, you know, Uh, whether or not actresses are fuckable. He talks about, you know, he very famously got caught reaching out to the director of 310 to Yuma trying to get naked shots of an actress who was in the film. Vanessa Shaw. Vanessa Shaw, thank you. Um, James Mangold. Yes, and so just like his, his, his history of repellence reaches back. What's going to be nutty about this, and it doesn't take much because this is the drum he likes to beat a lot, but this is going to be another example for what he likes to think of as the woke mafia coming after him and the, the Khmer Rouge that makes it impossible for a white guy to make a living now. And it's like, dude, you know, I, his lack of understanding of the larger issues is always just appalling, but it's like, if it turns out we've reached this rare historical moment where being a person of color or a woman or queer is uh, gives you a leg up in any industry, then they are enjoying the same privilege that you as a mediocre white dude have enjoyed for decades. <laughs> and so like the, uh, you know, every woman and queer person and person of color that you've seen succeed in various paths, you have to figure out how to like work harder, be better and stand out in the crowd when you are not being given a let up for a leg up for being a mediocre white man. Like that's just how it's going to be now. And so he needs to get over it. Well, also it's this nonsense about like, Oh, I'm a straight shooter. I'm not PC. It's like, no, you're just an asshole. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> There's, those welcome are two to consequences <laughs> yeah welcome exactly. to consequences like the, yeah that dude's been i mean i know i've seen him on more than one occasion like have temper tantrums for having to wait in line at a screening right like oh it's just, god yeah like yeah dude's a fucking oh, sleazy. He, he he left a film festival that he had been invited to because they wouldn't because the hotel wi-fi wasn't good enough I mean, like, it, it, this guy is in, insanely entitled and says terrible shit and then, like, immediately plays the victim when anybody calls him on the shit that he says. So, Slee stack. More of that coming, I suppose. Yeah. Um, cancel culture. Um, speaking of horrible white men, you guys, the LAPD is investigating Army Hammer for sexual assault. It goes beyond lewd messages and weird Instagram posts and stories of infidelity and drugs. Like he's being investigated for allegedly like beating a woman for like four hours straight in. Uh, I remember when we got the back. news, right. We hadn't really talked about this on the shows, but when we, we, I know when there was a text thread, where we were talking about how he got dropped by his agency and by his publicist. And we it was talked like, about that. Oh, did we talk about it on the show? Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, like, 
man, if your personal publicist drop you, you're in trouble. Like they know yeah. something like the personal, you know, for those that don't know, like the personal publicist, you get fairly embedded with the person you're representing and you know, a lot of shit that's going on. Um, and it, yeah, like I think I said, doesn't before, look good. if they can get you out of something, then they're going to stick around and charge you a lot more. But if they can't get you out of something and they dump you, then you've probably done something. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about the Vanity Fair piece from, what was it, a week ago now? Two yeah. weeks ago, something like that? I mean, it was upsetting and shocking. And there were lots of like sex thrown jokes afterwards because of that part of the of the piece. But even while I was reading it in the back of my mind, I was like, well, there's something else coming, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, to Matt's point, because so many of his business people had dropped him, it was just that sense of, and it's a weird thing where like, when you work in this world, you know that that was the sign. That was the sign that something terrible was coming. And when that, that news dropped, I guess it was yesterday, about the accusations, there was still a little part of me that thought, is that it or is there still more to come? Right. You know, like, unfortunately, with situations like this, it's often not an isolated incident. And right. so there may be more things that are going to be coming out or the story will embolden other people to have the courage to step up and, and talk about their own experiences. So if that story seemed really shocking to people, hang on, there may be more <laughs> things coming. Yeah, and all these high-profile projects that he was supposed to be a part of all fell apart in a matter of days. Like, Jennifer Lopez is not going to risk her brand on, you know, a rom-com with this awful, abusive guy, allegedly. So, um, yeah, so this story keeps coming. Every, every week there's some awful new piece of news about Army Hammer. So um, that is that. Good people, good guys doing good things. Ryan Reynolds, did you guys see this this couple days ago? Mm. He supposedly was... had never seen Green Lantern, <laughs> which I'm not sure I, I believe. I don't I'm buy sure that. I'm sure if I believe that either. <laughs> I don't yeah, buy that. I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to engage in the conceit, though, that Ryan Reynolds has not seen it for what's about to come. Right. So he live tweeted it. He, he drank the gin brand that he owns uh, and he live tweeted himself watching Green Lantern and like was watching it on his laptop because he was taking like pictures from his phone of his laptop. And you could see the <laughs> reflection of him when he's like, hey, look, it's Blake Lively. And he took some like horrible <laughs> cell phone picture of himself with his eventual wife. Anyway, very cute. Oh, uh. I, you know, I remember not hating Green Lantern when it came out, but I haven't seen it in a long time. So, I mean, yeah. the say. story I heard about, I, I didn't keep up with it because the headline was enough for me to not never pay attention to it <laughs> afterwards. But what was the thing I read about Zack Snyder saying that at one point he was tempted to have Green Lantern in Justice League? Did they dream? Uh, hold, hold that thought when we get to the uh, Justice League spoilers conversation. We can. Oh. Talk. That's, a, that's oh. what we call in the business a teaser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, I live tweeted now. one of Gabe's grade school uh, talent shows a few years back. That was a hoot. <laughs> and yes, I was drinking at the time. I was say, were you drinking <laughs> Ryan Reynolds' brand of gin? No, I was drinking <laughs> rum. Uh, it on brand. So much to talk about. Things are opening up, you guys. Okay, before I get to that, let's, let's stay in superhero land here. There's mm -hmm. going to be a queer Captain America. Yes, apparently there is a, an upcoming series of comics where there are various Captain Americas, and one of them is a gay man who defends uh, the unhoused Almost, and yeah, runaways oh. and whatnot. Sure, bring it. Yeah, I'm there's a story where, where, yeah, it's a story where uh, um, Captain America and Falcon, Sam Wilson, who's also been Captain America, uh, and the U.S. agent character, John Walker, are all out looking for the shield. Um, and it turns up, it's, it turns out it's been picked up by various characters uh, to defend people that need defending. And this is one of the characters. Um, so cool. So next time the Republicans do something really, really terrible that they don't want to talk about on Fox News, Tucker Carlson will devote an entire episode to this. What's happening now? Is the cat in the hat gay too? <laughs> Well, Captain Gay America. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at that tie. Come on. <laughs> His hat is very jaunty. Um, mm. So many things are opening up, right? Things are, are happening. My kid was in school all week, which is amazing. Um, the CDC just today said 
that three feet between students is fine, is a safe distance rather than the six feet, which previously it has been the standard for all public spaces, no matter where you are. So that gives folks a lot of hope about being able to get back in the classroom and get back in full time. Like my son was in school, you know, half days, four days this week. So there's hope that things might be opening up because kids aren't quite so you know, what is, what is likely w- to transmit it. What does the WHO say? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm always just a little dubious about everything. That, when the government starts talking about opening schools again, I'm wondering, like, what's wagging the dog here? So, we like, I mean, if, health care. I if it really is three feet child raised, care to get I'm, adults back to work. Exactly. I'm just a touch uh, dubious. I would think that it would be fairly, you know, and I'm somewhat surprised that this didn't happen early on. Like the way to get the kids to stay safe is just say, look, everybody's got cooties. <laughs> it's super spreader cootie rules. Don't touch, don't get <laughs> near anyone. because Your cootie shot good. will not save you. Exactly. You need a real shot. Well, in Nick's class this past week, they were only four feet, four feet apart, but they had like plexiglass shields on the front of their desks. Mm. And they each had individual desks and they were all facing the same direction and they all had masks on the whole time so again we are a smaller community we are a smaller school district but i think that this new news gives hope that people who've been languishing at home can get back in there and salvage a bit of the school year yeah. it'll be good other things that are opening that i know none of you guys are going to go to anytime soon <laughs> magic mountain opens on april 1st disneyland and california and vengeance oh, right <laughs> <laughs> you want you want to go on colossus <laughs> psych you can't <laughs> Um, Disneyland and California Adventure are reopening on April 30th. All these places are going to have reduced capacity. Also, a rule. No screaming. Scream quietly within your heart. Within your heart, yes. Like, yeah. As I do all day, I, every day. No I was gonna say, mm-hmm. that, that I've been practicing for the last year. It won't be that hard. <laughs> uh, I have a curiosity um, for, for both Christy and Matt in terms of kids. Is this news exciting? Are people excited? Like, Are kids excited about uh, amusement parks, theme parks oh. reopening. Uh, Gabe likes to go to Universal. Um, oh. He and his friends like to go to, especially around Halloween Horror Nights. Then that's a thing that he goes to yeah. a bunch of times while that's open. So uh, he, I know he was really bummed out in October that they couldn't do any of that. But um, that's where he's more likely to like go meet up with his friends at City Walk and do stuff. Uh, so. That's what he would like to do. I like going to Disneyland. Um, I have been doing it every year for my birthday for the last few years, but not this year because it was closed. Uh, well, maybe you will. Will you in December of the year we're in now to do a makeup on your 50th? Probably, yeah. I, I like. I generally go to Disneyland once a year at Christmas time. I don't know if this year is going to be that year, but maybe. We'll maybe see. things will be really different in about eight months. Maybe. I don't know. Um, Tim, to answer your question, I think Nick is not terribly gung-ho about Disneyland anyway, so mm-hmm. he's not been hounding me. Um, but um, maybe down the road a bit, I think he's still kind of cautious. I think he's kind of like, eh, it's fine. Um, but movie theaters are opening more and more. I believe what, Matt, are all the AMCs open today now? I know it was just a couple on Monday, but are they all I, open now? They're supposed to all be open today, as of today, okay. allegedly. Okay. Well, we know Christopher Nolan has gone. Because he went yeah. to the first showing of Judas and the Black Messiah at the AMC Burbank on Monday. And there's a picture that Reuters posted of him. He is nothing if not a company man. <laughs> he is. He loves the cinema and must be immersed by it at all, at all times. So, um, so Tim, how did Nolan, you know you have to dress up, right? Because you know people are going to. <laughs> like if I win, I mean, I could. I mean, this is why I'm wearing it is fine, but if I'm Christopher Nolan, I probably have to like wear the Christopher Nolan outfit. I suspect he was doing that at home the whole time anyway. Like, I don't think he owns a pair of sweatpants. Uh, honestly, I th- I'm sure you're right. I think true right. story. I don't think he hangs around the house dressed like the dude. True story. I saw him. I was hiking up Runyon Canyon, and he was coming down Runyon Canyon, wearing dress shoes and like you know uh, pleated slacks and uh, and was like dictating all along to his assistant who was next to him i'm like this was just your workout outfit okay fine that's, that's, that's not good for your like... feet that's not good for no, your it's not good for your feet i hope there was some <laughs> arch support in there at least <laughs> um tim how do you feel about theaters reopening this is a discussion that we have every single week here and i know what matt and alonzo think how do you feel about going back to the movies i am not ready to go back to theaters yet myself because i just haven't been vaccinated yet um, 
but I'm itching for it. Mm -hmm. I miss it. I really, really miss it. And, you know, I saw some, not just the Christopher Nolan picture, but just some other AMC pictures of people going to theaters on that first day here in Los Angeles. And at least for that first day, it seems like AMC has done a really good job of being really super careful, or at least putting across the appearance that they're being super careful, which sometimes can make all the difference in terms of just how safe you feel in a situation like that. I'm looking forward to movies like in the theater. I have a friend who's not in our world, but is just a big movie person. And he's really excited because he can finally see Nomadland. He mm -hmm. waited, he has Hulu, but he didn't want to see it. He wanted to see it in the theater. And he's like, you know, I can go see Nomadland in the theater and I'm so excited. I haven't seen Nomadland in the theater. I'm yeah. betting you guys haven't either. So no. I'm, I'm envious of that. Uh, I don't know if he's if he's vaccinated yet or not, but I am anxious, whether it's like the return of baseball season or mm. movie theaters coming back. Like, fingers crossed, like baby steps, it feels like the life I know is coming back. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. I'm not ready yet myself, but I'm yeah. very happy for people who are vaccinated to God bless them. Go, go to a yeah. movie. Yeah, publicists are already starting to offer like, oh, we're yeah. going to, if you want to see this, I'm like, not yet, not yet. Like, you know, I, I, I told one of them, I said two weeks after my second vaccine, then we can, yeah. we can discuss on a case by case basis but at the moment no but i wonder I, though tim if you go to like the first matinee on a weekday of nomadland like how many people are really going to be there for that right, i guess but it, but it, it, it's the thing but like we always talk about the ventilation and whatnot like uh, if, has amc come out and said do we know like that they've up, up their know. game in that department because yeah you might be in a room that nobody else is in but you don't know like how many people were in there the day before what's still lingering who was in there cleaning up and did they have a mask on like i don't know there's there's a lot of variables also on april 1st lacma the la county museum of art opens again i have to tell you that's actually one of the ones i'm most missing there was a piece yeah. in the LA times um about uh museums opening reopening as like the idea of walking around in a museum is actually something i, I, I deeply as much as i miss movies and movie theaters like just actually being around a, like a, a museum is something i'm like Dying, 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 dying to uh, to, to, to Dave, Dave misses museums and galleries a lot. Yeah, yeah. the peace of it, the peace, the quiet, and like the smell. <laughs> the smell, right? Yeah. yeah. See, I'm on the opposite end. Like, I miss bars. I miss. I mean, I was I thinking about bars. this today. I actually tweeted about this. Like, how do we go back to karaoke where people are, like passing that gross mic around and like mm. everybody touches it and everybody's got their mouth close to it? Like, of course, the same question goes for bongs. But oh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I've been asking, like, are, are we going to stop? Are people going to stop blowing out birthday candles? Because uh, that's just think about it. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I just think that, that's something we, we didn't think about it for a long time. And I was kind of like, maybe we just sort of wave the flame. We'll out all have yeah. those little like, like handheld little portable fan things. We'll just. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look like I'm also on the like I, I am excited to go back to theaters as my own vaccination approaches, I can tell I've already got a little bit, there's this little voice in my head. It's like, fuck it, you got vaccine, vaccinated. You can do whatever you want. And I know that I'm not going to do that, but it, it does like the, the fear of going out does certainly lessen. I also realized the other day, because I grew up, my mom, when I was a kid, liked going to movies. So she, she started taking my brother and I to movies when I was like six or seven. Um, this is the longest period of time in my life that I've Same gone here. without going to see a movie in a theater. Yeah. Yeah, since I was like six or something. Yeah, for sure. Same. Since I started going. Weirdly enough, I think my first sort of like post vaccination plans have been like, I haven't had a medical checkup in, you know, a year. I have like other, I need to go to a dentist, like, like just a lot of stupid mundane stuff. But then I'm also kind of making a list of like, I want to go to restaurants and I want to do this and I want to do that. And, you know. I've never been to Catalina, you know, I don't oh. know, just whatever, but it was yeah. zip lining. It's so fun. Um, let's talk really fast. And then we got to move on to Tim's book. Of course, the mm -hmm. main reason that he is here. Um, Alonzo, you got your first shot this week, Matt, this week. you're getting, you're getting your first shot today. Let's talk about that experience for both of you guys. Yeah. So I have, I have comorbidities. I have uh, various health issues that put me on the list to qualify after March 15th. They opened it up to people who were uh, 18 to 64 who had other qualifying things, which I have. 
Um, you know, I think there's always the debate to be had, does BMI mean anything, you know, but nonetheless, I'm going to rock that while I got it. So yeah, I went and it was, uh, I made an appointment at a, like a private pharmacy in the Valley. They had two chairs set up on the sidewalk out front and all of the, all of the stuff that the, the pharmacist and the nurse needed. So I didn't have to walk into any place. It was all out in the parking lot, uh, showed them my, you know, ID and my insurance ID, um, got the shot, you know, I had to, had to fill out a questionnaire in advance, got the shot. They asked me to hang around for 15 minutes to make sure that I was okay. I was, Dave and I both got ours. And then we, we went home and uh, we were a little logy, but you know, like these days, who's to say if that's the vaccination or just, you know, it was Wednesday. So, uh, but so far so good. Matt, and then you're going today. I am going today. I have comorbidities. Um, I have asthma that I've always had, and then I have a fairly recent uh, return of a uh, somewhat terrifying heart problem um, that, you know, look like I would probably just roll with, but it has made the idea of COVID that much scarier. And so when I say, like, I don't think I'd survive, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that flippantly, like, I've kind of just had to deal with that. And so I've been the one that's, like, really hardcore like when the talk comes about like oh maybe gabe will go back to school and i'm like i'm terrified of that so uh you know as we're getting closer in la to the vaccine hitting people at our age i've i've kind of thought like well maybe i could wait and my wife has said otherwise She's like nope you gotta go get it so yeah. you know and not like i'm trying to virtue signal but yeah i realized that yes i need to go get it because uh, oh my god they actually would miss me if i wasn't here so um i'm going today uh this afternoon and then my they let me make the follow-up appointment while i scheduled this one um which will be the uh, april 9th so you're going to uh, a pharmacy know. or where are you going uh yeah i'm going to a pharmacy right near my house okay that is great i'm really happy for you guys Thanks. I don't know when I can get it. I'm, I'm of two minds. I'm conflicted about it because I keep hearing anecdotal stories about, oh, there's a CVS in, on the peninsula where if you just hang out at the end of the day, they got extra, like it's a milkshake and they got a little bit more in the cup. So well, there that, is that, that happening, about, right? Like they got to throw that shit out otherwise. So right. I'm torn. I, like I'm, I'm too young. I'm 48 and I'm healthy. Like, mm -hmm. but do I go anyway for the greater good or is waiting for the greater good? I'm conflicted on this. I, I think go, if, if literally they were either going to throw it out or put it in your arm, then I think you're helping them not waste it. And you're not like ripping it out of somebody else's, you know, queue. Mm -hmm. So if you have the time and the wherewithal to go get on that waiting list, you should do it. But at the same time, we have the relative privilege of like, we work at home, we stay at home. Yeah. And, you know, like I, w I was very much prepared to like, absolutely, you know, be one of the last people to get it or whatever. But, you know, I didn't break in line, like they opened right. it up to people with, with specific conditions that I do have that Dave has. So we were like, then we're gonna go do it. And so we did it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would not feel like that, that going to do the standby list is like a bad thing or that you're screwing somebody over because literally that stuff is so volatile that yeah. at the end of the day they will throw it out yeah tim what yeah. are your thoughts on all this yeah I, i'm basically of the same mind if, if it is not if you are not jumping the queue mm -hmm. i think it's okay i mean i am i feel very fortunate health wise i don't have any pre-existing conditions so i am just waiting and my wife susan the same thing we are both just hanging out and waiting and really the last few weeks as we see more and more people that we know getting vaccinated we're just staying inside as we have i mean for me honestly even more than like movie theaters and all that stuff that we talked about um susan and i have really good friends and their kids are our god kids and they are moving to colorado in june oh. i would like to see them before they uh -huh. go and that to me is like that's the only reason, I, and I would not do this, but the only reason I would actually like jump the line or something is just to see them before they go. But I feel like we're going to have enough time. And so Susan and I are totally okay with like hanging out at home, doing the thing we've been doing for the months and months and months that preceded this. We put our names in all like the wait lists and stuff like that. If, if our name comes up, that's great, but we're cool just hanging out at home at this point. 
It's worth pointing out also, we're all in California. Every state has a different thing going on. Other states are like doing everybody and other states are behind us in terms of, no, we're still dealing with the elderly or the, you yeah. know, the first responders and the teachers or whatever. So, um, you know, that's just our current experience, but it may well be that, like, I, I know I've been talking to friends in South Carolina, they have a different situation going on. And so it, this is all very much a weird state by state. Welcome to federalism thing, you know. One of my great friends, her parents are in Houston and they are elderly and like one of them has gotten the first shot and it's taken all this time just to get that far along. So Texas, I guess, is taking longer. I don't know. Anyway, um, yes, we will all get it eventually really fast. Also, Yafet Koto died this week yes. at age 81. Always an amazing presence in everything. Made everything better. Yeah, there's a great Yafet Koto movie. I was going to say Blue Collar. There's a new Blu-ray that came out in 2019. I highly recommend. I know everybody. Everybody's go-to is Alien, of course. Why not? Yeah. You know, Homicide. And, and, I love and, homi and, and Homicide, of course. But like, if you've never seen Paul Schrader's Blue Collar, uh, Yafit Kato, very uh, early screen appearance by Richard Pryor, and a fairly young Harvey Keitel too. Really great movie. He's super fun in uh, Live and Let Die. Die Run. Oh, in Live and Let Die. Yeah, yeah. In, Le in Live and Let Die, he's super fun, and Midnight Run is he? Yeah. Agent Alonzo Mosley. Mm. So funny in that. All right. Tim, any thoughts before we move on to your book? Uh, I mean, Alien was, I mean, it's the, the basic answer, but Alien is <laughs> I mean, Alien is the it's one. It's a good one. I mean, it's a good it, one. It, it is a good and you're one. a basic bitch. That's true. <laughs> no, he's got insight because he wrote a book that the rest of us didn't write. It is called This Is How You Make a Movie. Tim, tell us about the inspiration behind your book. Okay, so about three years ago, um, my editor, who I worked with on another book, had said to me, what would you think about doing a book that boils down the most basic elements of how movies are put together? I mean, it was really that simple. And I talked to her, and then I thought about it, and I made a list of every sort of like film teaching points I could think of in acting and directing and writing and editing and music. And I started to think about it, and I was like, yeah, actually, this would be sort of a fun thing. And so what I came up with is a bunch of different teaching points, um, how films are put together, using three film examples for every one. So whether it's canted angles or non-diegetic sound or, you know, zooms or close-ups or anything else, I tried to make the picks as diverse as possible. So maybe you have a quote unquote classic older film and then you have something more recent maybe you have a kids movie um there is one documentary uh, in there which i'm very happy about and i really just try to make as wide a cast as wide net as possible i didn't try to do these are the most important movies these are the greatest films of all time it was really just examples here's how, uh, here are like movies here are how movies are put together here are examples of how a film is put together. And my hope, and the thing I've heard from a lot of people, which I'm really happy about, is that people have heard of maybe say half of the movies and they haven't heard of the other half of the movie. Ah, cool. And so what they say is like, oh, I, so I, I knew this movie and I, and I knew this movie, but I didn't know the other movie. And so I was really intrigued to check out that movie. And that's a really hard, like, goal to reach but that they actually hear the people are saying that makes me really happy because in a lot of ways i want it to be something where whether you're 17 years old or you're an adult and you're in the movies but don't know the terminology there's stuff in there for you and i have to say also just like our peers and our colleagues the fact that that folks like like you guys and people i know are also getting something out of the, out of the book that also means a lot to me well, so you are clearly so knowledgeable. You've been doing this for a long time, writing about film, talking about film. What did you learn along the way that surprised you or maybe opened your eyes to a certain aspect of filmmaking? That's really interesting. I mean, for me, it was a friend of mine who works on sets um, texted me and said, I love that you wrote a book called This Is How You Make a Movie. And you've never actually been on a set to make a movie, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. I was in I was in film school, and so I did short films. But that's nowhere in comparison to an actual, uh, especially a Hollywood studio film. And so for me, there was a learning curve in terms of I don't get into a lot of the nitty gritty about like how cameras work and things like that. But I have a little bit of that in there. And I have a friend who uh, his name is John Baumgartner, and he's a filmmaker. And before I finished the book, I sent it to him and I said. 
tell me everything I got wrong. Tell me everything. <laughs> tell me everything that you as a filmmaker would look at and be like, this guy is such a film critic. He knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so incredibly gracious and generous and said like, well, we don't call it this anymore. We call it this. And actually oh. in, in this way, it, you're kind of right, but it's a little bit more like this now. And this has kind of changed. I mean, it's been 25 something years since I've been to film school. Things have changed. Terminology has changed. And so he was enormously helpful. So that was a really kind of humbling experience. And I have to say just in general, just making a, a book with that title, this is how you make a movie, mm. you are instantly opening yourself up for people being like, really? <laughs> um, and, for, and I mentioned this in the introduction, and I think people who read the book will get this. The book does not actually pretend that it's the definitive guide to how you make a movie. My hope with the book is that people go, oh, there's actually lots of different ways. And sometimes Tim's examples contradict each other in terms of how different techniques are used in movies. So you can do it this way or you can do it that way. Um, so I was always kind of going into this being like, I know a lot about movies, but there's a lot of people who know a lot of other things about movies that I don't know. And so for me, it was a big learning process in terms of putting this thing together. Is there a movie that you use, I'm curious, is there a movie that you use as an example for something that sets a good example for one of the points you're making that you, Tim Grierson, don't personally care for? <laughs> it is, I have to say, what is very funny is that this is the question I've been asked the most. It's very, and I think, because people, there's a couple of people know me and they're like, but you don't like hardcore Henry that much. Why did you use that? <laughs> <laughs> and my argument is that the movies don't have to be classics, but the technique should be interesting. And so I use hardcore Henry for uh, POV. Because um, sometimes I would think, where are, the, where are the examples that people are going to know? Well, what's an example that they may not have thought of? And Hardcore Henry, which I think is not that, entirely... That, that movie is nothing if not illustrative of something. <laughs> and next week, nobody comes out. His, uh, his, the Sam filmmaker's next movie, which is not first-person POV, thank God. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, for me, like, I... And also what's funny is I, I have talked to people who are like, oh, God, I love that movie that you mentioned. And I'm actually not a big fan of that movie. <laughs> so I, and that's fine. I mean, I really feel like my job was not to be a critic in terms of saying these movies are bad, these movies don't work. My job was to say, here's a technique. And the technique in this movie is used this way. And so um, Parkour Henry is one. <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> one. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of Down With Love, which I know might, might hmm. uh, anger. But the technique in that movie I will now is, cut you is, off the show <laughs> um, I love Peyton Reed But that movie's not one of my favorites of his um, But that technique In terms of split screen in that movie is great um, And Especially if you know it in connection to like The Rock Hudson movies I mean, it's Pillow like, Talk um. Yeah, it's like Pillow Talk especially is such, a, is such a reference in that And so that was just sort of a fun way To, 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 to include you, know, you asked me about the things I learned. It was kind of like, you know what? My taste is important, and I put a lot of my own personal favorites in it. But I was also like, you know what? It's also okay to be more kind of open-minded in terms of some of these movies. And so, yeah, there, I, I, I don't want to say any more than that in terms of movies that didn't <laughs> like they're, they're in there. But for the most part, it's like, I think if you read those examples, though, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, Tim doesn't like these movies because I wrote it for people who actually do like those movies and try to explain like this is this technique this is how this works it's has an it amazing changed... oh, go ahead, go ahead. no so has it changed the way you watch movies now in terms of yeah, are you still always on the lookout for smash cuts or uh you know a thing a narration or whatever that you might be that you know when you were writing this obviously you had to be sensitive to and on the lookout for yeah it's funny because my first semester of, of film school they said you're going to hate movies for a little while <laughs> you're gonna, because you're going to be just you're going to be beaten down with technique that all you'll do is you'll see movies in terms of act breaks and all of these techniques and how these things are working but eventually you'll get over it i think that was really helpful because when i did this book i wasn't i, I was sort of absorbed all of that i mean in some ways it was more of the the process of I don't have to think about examples anymore. I can just watch movies and not worry. Like once I once I got through the entire list and written the whole damn book, I was like, okay, 
that's this now I'm actually done with it. What's funny for me is that actually going through the book and seeing that the order in which it's laid out is like, oh, this is actually kind of telling its own story because I was just doing it in bits and pieces in that way. And now actually when I saw the layout, it's like, oh, it's actually like, it tells its own story that I hadn't necessarily like even anticipated in terms of writing it, which is kind of fun. But I, I finished it months ago. And so when the books actually arrived, like, you know, when the book arrives at your house, it's like, it doesn't feel like you wrote it anymore. It's like, <laughs> oh, this other human being wrote this thing and put my name on it. I hope Who wrote this? I don't entirely remember it now, but no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tickled with how it turned out. It's an amazing array of filmmakers that you explore here. Alonzo, you've got the book in front of you. Will you just name off a few of the... Sure, the, the ones listed on the cover are Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Stanley Kubrick, Alfonso Cuaron, Wes Anderson, Francis Ford Coppola, Quentin Tarantino, Lynn Ramsey, Paul Thomas Anderson, mm -hmm. Catherine Bigelow, Alfred Hitchcock, Stephen Queen, Barry Jenkins, Sophia Coppola, Claire Denis, Andrea Arnold, Jean-Luc Godard, Christopher Nolan, Wong Kar Wai, Jane Campion, Gus Van Sant, Tim Burton, Terrence Malick, Robert Altman, Spike Lee, Jacques Tati, and many more. Yes. So that's an amazing array of, of filmmakers, a really diverse array. Um, do you now feel differently about any of their bodies of work than you did prior to launching into this project? I don't know if I feel differently. Um, one of the things that was important to me in the book was I didn't do original interviews for the book with, the, with these filmmakers or actors or screenwriters, but I tried to find interviews with them as much as I could if it illustrated the teaching points. And partly because I wanted to have their voice in there in terms of this idea of being humble about this whole process. It's like, they're actually the people who made the darn things. Mm -hmm. They should talk about what it was that inspired them. Some interviews I, I had done previously for other publications and then re, you know incorporated them in the book, uh, like with Lynn Ramsey and some other people. But I'm not sure if I had a, a if I felt differently about them, I think I felt differently about just the idea of how do you teach people or how do you get people interested in movies? Because I've, I've taught a couple things, but not like an actual like film course. And the idea of like putting together like a syllabus of these are the movies that the students have to watch. It's like, how do you make that balance between more recent things that will seem more engaging to them versus this is an older movie however you define what an older movie is. Like when I have younger colleagues say like, oh, I saw that like that really old movie and that movie came out in the 1990s and I saw that movie in the theater. Yeah. I, I instantly turn a thousand years old and crumble <laughs> in dust, you know? Um, but that balance of some people have an aversion to black and white movies. How do you get them engaged? Like I wanted to make sure Star Wars was in there. I want to make sure Rocky was in there. Like people have told me, I'm so glad Elf is in there. Like <laughs> people, people have seen Elf. People have seen Elf. They're conversant with it. You don't have to say, well, this is Roy Anderson, and he's a really great <laughs> filmmaker, but you see, and you have to explain all this stuff. And so trying to get that balance was really, for me, like more of the challenge, because I didn't want it to be something where I didn't want it to be so mainstream that it was all mainstream movies but i also didn't want it to be like look how smart i am right. you know i i've seen an antonioni film or i've seen other you <laughs> no, i didn't want to i didn't want it to be a thing where because i think the trick sometimes with a book like this is you want to show your bona fides in terms of who you are as a film critic and my feeling was you can do some of that but that's not what the book is about so you've got to balance this stuff and you have to write it in a way where anybody can feel like this is an engaging voice. This is an engaging perspective. I really, I mean, someone told me like, oh, Roger Ebert must have been a model for you. <laughs> and I actually didn't think of Roger Ebert, but it's funny and it's a great compliment. Like that's what Roger Ebert did really well. He made you feel like whatever high or low the movie was, he was on your wavelength and he talked to you in a very kind of like conversational way. So it doesn't really answer your question, always, but for me, it was, <laughs> no. more, about, it was more about figuring out, um, I've only got 180 pages to do this. Mm -hmm. So I've got, I, I kind of have to figure out the films I'm going to do. And I want to include as many different voices as, as humanly possible in this thing. And so in some ways it was like, who are the voices that matter? Who do you really want to get in here? I'm like, mm -hmm. Kelly Riker's got to be in this. Mm -hmm. Lynn Ramsey has to be in this. Claire Denis has to be in this. Like, mm -hmm. 
like filmmakers I really, really love absolutely have to be in this thing. You know, 2001 is my favorite movie that's gonna make it um, in there. I think for me, the, the challenge was just figuring out this balance, this mixture. It seems like people are, are into the mixture. It seems like people like it, so I'm happy. As you, were, we, okay, I was gonna say, as you were describing your approach to high and low, I was thinking about Roger. So the, I completely agree with that comparison because that's, he made everything seem accessible. He never talked down to you. He was brilliant, but he never talked down to you. And you totally have that in your voice as well. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kim, are, are there any plans for a follow-up? This is how you don't make a movie with <laughs> examples as well, because I would read the fuck out of that book. <laughs> <laughs> right. be, All Tommy Wiseau. Okay. Oh. Epidemic. To use the keyboard analogy would be the I I hated, 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 hated. <laughs> um thank you, Matt. That's a great idea. I more will, hardcore will, here. I will give you a cut um for that. <laughs> I mean I think in general, as much as I love as much as I really love reading people who hate movies and writing like a really like terrible like a takedown of a terrible movie. I think my natural inclination is I tend to be more of an enthusiast than somebody who really likes like knocking stuff down. So as great as that idea is, <laughs> and I may still steal it from you, Matt, I think my more natural inclination is being like the guy who goes, oh, you gotta check this out. Oh, you gotta check this out. As fun as that book would be, mm -hmm. I probably would not be the right person to. Uh, <laughs> and also who needs, you know, the internet is such a, uh, a forgiving, kind place. <laughs> and if I wrote a book such as that, I wouldn't hear from anybody who was upset with me that I didn't like a movie that they put. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I only follow one person on Twitter. So I, I <laughs> all other people are. Um, so, yeah. Where can folks find your book? Um, it is on Amazon. It's on Bookshop. It's kind of everywhere if people don't like amazon and i understand completely bookshop will actually support local bookstores it's got a great cover i can't take credit really for that cool. cover but that cover when that when i saw that i was like oh this may actually be a good book yeah Which that's a great cover. Cover. google it looks google like 1960s post serials right. this is the font no i i was no, i was gonna I, say I, I, it looks like vintage blue note album cover yeah, I have to say, I, when you mentioned that, Alonzo, on Facebook, neither Susan and I were familiar with that. So I was like, oh, my God. So, <laughs> it was so my first law, thought. <laughs> yeah, so the, that lawsuit is coming very quickly. <laughs> I can't, now, uh, I can't wait. Another uh, question for those of us that don't read much, when is the movie adaptation coming? <laughs> well, I'm actually working on that right now. That's a, this is a Breakfast All Day exclusive. <laughs> I'm, currently, I'm currently working on that. It, it's funny because this is my uh, seventh book, which is really kind of crazy. And one of the things that my, I don't talk to my parents about my books when I'm working on them because I just, I don't like talking about them until they're done. So my parents have been pestering me saying, so are you working on a book currently? And I'll say, no, I'm not. And they're like, yeah. no, really? <laughs> I'm like, no, I honestly swear to God, I'm not um, at the but moment. You, know, you should think about making this into a documentary, actually, because I think it's one thing for you to describe in text these techniques and things. But if you could get the clips together, I think it would be a neat little like 100 minute film school for people who just want the basic idea of like, here's what a crane shot looks like. Yeah, or but the producer right? in me immediately is like, Oh my God, how do you clear all that? That's why they can't show fair this film. use. I, fair use. Look, if, if, you could, if you could put Los Angeles Plays itself out on Blu ray now, which they have, and Room yeah. 237, they, they, they have really opened up the fair use window. And this is totally educational slash you know, critical uh, use. I think, there's, I think there's something here. And that whole CNN, the movie series that they did, they showed clips. Every single episode was a different decade. They showed clips. So. Well, I don't want to give away too much about my movie adaptation because it's still in the process. <laughs> and since we're all friends here, I can tell you that rather than using the actual film clips, I'm going to recreate them through uh, clay animation. Nice. So it's actually just taking me a really long time. <laughs> that thing's, I had seen the Parks and Rec clip, but really that thing is hard. It's really, really difficult. It takes forever. We look, we'll, we'll review that when that comes out. All right, Tim, sure. you're amazing. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to do film reviews, so stick around. Yes, for sure. Alonzo, do the spiel.
I will. Oh, and real quick, uh, Tim will be joining us uh, next week on a film and a movie uh, where he brought a pairing with him. And it's going to it's a great conversation. So do check that out. Anyway, thank you for watching. Like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us at BeFast All Day on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash BeFast All Day. We are kicking off our uh, subscriber exclusive recaps of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And we'll be looking back at all four parts of Alan V. Farrow. Matt, you have a hand up. We have two marquees. <gasps> oh. oh, just a couple of marquees, but there was one really important one. This is the one we opened our show with. It's the Grand Lake Theater uh, up in Oakland. We've shown a bunch of signs for them. Their most recent sign says, help end the COVID-19 pandemic. Keep wearing your mask, get vaccinated ASAP. Uh, this other one, this second and one- And they have the one sheet for the mask in front of the theater. Oh, ah. very nice. Yes, behave responsibly, wear a mask. Uh, and then this next one came from uh, Anna Bird in the UK. It <laughs> right. says, may the 17th be with you, which is the date that theaters opened in the UK. Uh, it's the Prince Charles Cinema. And she gave us this note on Facebook. It says, hey guys, love your show. I'm Anna Bird, currently based in London, sending you this marquee of the Prince Charles Cinema in the city to explain the meaning of the sign. On May 17th, cinemas in the UK are supposed to reopen. This cinema is constantly changing its marquee during UK's long lockdown. Oh, and if you show it, do you mind saying hi to Or Drury? So hi, Or Drury. Hi. He is your fan and also my boyfriend who is now in Israel and can't visit because of COVID. Oh, so, wow. Oh, Drury. Hello. Hi. Yeah. We're saying hello to you. And clearly, Anna misses you. And hope you can go back to the UK and see her soon. Uh, that's it for Marquis this week. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.